Today, we're going to talk a bit about Revelation, the book of Revelation, which we've been talking about all along. And um, it's about um, Revelation 4, chapter 4, and it's about the throne in heaven, throne of God in heaven. Great place. Be something to see, wouldn't it? And um, all right, I'll sing a little bit and see if it works for you. said, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last, don't be afraid, I'm your future and your past, the Alpha Omega by whom all things were made, I feel peace when I subtitle could be Don't Be Afraid. I cannot imagine seeing that or being there, and I'll describe some of that in these verses, uh, without being afraid. I can't imagine I know anybody who wouldn't be afraid of all of that. But there's our Lord who says, hey, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, so don't be afraid. So I'll read you these verses. This is in Revelation uh, chapter 4, starting verse 1. After this, that means after the seven churches, after God is, or Jesus has just spoken to him about the seven churches to John, and he's spoken about telling the angels or the messengers of the churches, the seven churches, right after this, that's in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. 
After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Very interesting idea. And the first voice which I, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? After what would be my first question. We'll talk about that. Uh, verse 2, I... Uh, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and with one seated on the throne. Verse 3, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper, which is, that basically is fiery red, and crinoline, which is um, actually blood red, um, sardis type of thing. Uh, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Verse 5. For the throne came from the throne, I'm sorry, came flashes of lightning and thunders and voices. And, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Pretty darn interesting at this point, don't you think? Verse 6. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And now that's pretty strange looking. Uh, verse 7. The first living creature like a lion, and the second living creature like an ox. And the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Okay. Verse 8, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within and the day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Verse 9, and whenever the living creatures um, gave give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, add a word, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That's chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. Now we'll look at again, we'll look at this a little bit deeper if you're okay with that idea. Because those are great scriptures. And they mean an awful lot, just as they are written. They mean a tremendous amount. Digging deeper in, in, as a word study, they mean more and more and more, and you'll find out as we go along, if you're okay with that idea. All right. As first, verse 1 of chapter 4. So after this, after all of the seven church thing that we talked about, uh, after this I looked, and behold, a door, which means free access, by the way, standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet or like a shofar, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Come up here. He's in heaven. What up here are we talking about? So in order to see around a throne, you probably have to be, a, you'd have to come up above to see that there's 24 elders. Can you imagine looking at a few elders on one side and looking through the throne with God seated on it and being able to see how many are on the other side? Do you see what I mean? So he had to ascend above it to, to see it. For us to get any closer to God, we're going to have to ascend from where we are in our spirits. It's going to have to be, because he said, 
Verse 2, at once I was in the Spirit. Key word. Okay. Um, the Greek word for come up here uh, is uh, rapture. Hmm. Interesting. Does anybody think that's interesting? And, you know, um, elevate here is what's in the um, ancient roots translinear Bible. Um, the words you, that what must take place. In other words, I will show you what must take place is used in all translations of the Bible. When this is unseen voice tells John, that's what this is, about what is granted or is inevitable to happen after the church, messengers give the words Jesus spoke to them. I think we, I think we talked about in the seven churches that the seven churches can represent the seven church ages, uh, ending with the Laodicean church. It also can represent the seven church movements, which we presently have. I'll explain that here in a little bit. Um, if you're okay with it. So at once I was in the spirit, verse two, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Um, that's also kind of described uh, something similar in Ezekiel one twenty six. That's a, a thing is um, he mentions the throne um, in heaven and so on and surrounded. It is indeed impossible to see what is happening in the spirit uh, even when it is right in front of you until one is caught up higher in the spirit. We have to lift your vision higher. We've got to lift what vision we live with on this earth higher than it is at this point. Or we're going to see things from the wrong perspective. It's like st standing beside, you know, the five blind men try to explain an elephant all standing in a different place. Uh, the same thing if you stood next to your car uh, and you stood at the, stared at the side and, so, and you'd never seen one before and somebody said, can you explain what it is? Uh, you say, yeah, it's got two wheels. Uh, you know, it's got this long thing. It's got looks like a doorway of some kind. Long thing out front. I don't know what it does. Well, it's got four wheels and you wouldn't know that until you got on the other side. Perspective is what's happening to us now. We're in perspective trouble because we're only looking at things from one point of view or one perspective. You've got to rise in the spirit to see what's really going on. And there is nothing in any news media that will give you anything but a one, one view perspective. Generally not a really good view either. So, verse 3. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper. Now he's talking about God. Had the appearance of Jasper, which means fiery red, like I said, and crinoline, which means blood red sardis, um, a sardius. Uh, and, and around the throne was a rainbow, a halo, it's often called, uh, that had the appearance of an emerald. So a rainbow is surrounding the throne. It's hard to get a grip on all of this, but... Keep in mind, there's more to this than, uh, than we know at this point in time. Uh, and around the throne were 24 elders, verse 4, were 24 elders, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. I'm sorry, I said this wrong. Along, around the throne were 24 thrones. That's what I meant to say. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. I often like the fact, you know, golden crowns. That's really exciting. All right. Guess what their crowns really are. These, these 24 elders are wearing white garments. The elders uh, wore um, heavenly brightness is what their crowns were basically. And they were crowns and they were not. This is an explanation from the Greek, uh, from the Greek of what, those crowns mean, these are 24 elders surrounding God, but those crowns mean is that they were, they were crowns of victory for civic worth, for military valor, for nuptial joy, meaning being happy with your relationship, your, your marriage, um, festival gladness, isn't that great? These crowns were woven of oak, of ivy, of myrtle, olive leaves, 
or flowers used as a wreath of garland. These crowns were not crowns of kings. They were crowns of people who won those crowns through civil worth. Isn't that interesting? The civil worth basically means being valuable to a community. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, military valor, that just means uh, bravery, uh, courage, walking in courage. Nuptial joy, a relationship with your wife and, or husband that is uh, joyful. That'll get you a crown in heaven. And will sit you next to God. Now, isn't that the weirdest thing in the world? You, <laughs> at any rate, I mean, just give that some thought there, you know, just before you complain about your relationship or complain about how you feel about this. Just give that a second of thought. Just give, you know, would, you, would you like to sit next to God? Hmm, let's see. Yeah, I think so. Could you find a moment of joy in the fact that you're married to the one God chose for you? Well, that's a whole other. Festival gladness. We might translate that the life of the party. Festival gladness is a fascinating thing. There is, uh, Israel always had feasts and they always had festivals and they were to do that. And they reenacted during these festivals uh, the victories of God for over, over Israel. God has been faithful, 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 faithful. And he brought Israel through victory after victory and they would have festivals celebrating the fact that God had delivered them festival joy. I am so filled with joy that you have delivered me from my enemies. Anybody? That'll get you a crown. That ain't bad. These crowns were woven of oak, ivy, myrtle, olive leaves, and or flowers. They were wreaths of garland. They and they were made of gold. At and when they got to heaven, they wore those crowns. Here, they were common. These were common people doing common things. Very well, by the way, but doing common things. So just about the time you think that the elders that surround God on the throne are a bunch of stiff necks who yell at people for not doing all the right things, you're wrong. They were common men who won this stunning right to sit next to God. Um, no one ever said that... Um, Those were only going to be 24 elders forever. Only the, those particular 24 elders would be all there ever is. Is there a rotation? Or is there anybody else who'd like to win a crown through some measure of something? Just, just a thought, just a thought. Don't go nuts. Um, so, now, verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning hmm, and thunders, thunderings, as it said, and voices. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. God likes the seventh thing. How does those torches become seven spirits of God? Interesting, don't you think? The Greek word for voices, by the way, uh, it's because there's voices, there's thunderings and lightnings, but there's voices. And the word, the Greek word is phone, P-H-O-N-E, phone. We get the phone, you know, hey, man, I got a phone. But we don't, we miss you. I mean, it's misused like crazy. But And it means the cry of a living being which can be heard by others. So the phone or the, it's a device to us. It's not a device. It's originally it is the ability to cry uh, in what's going on in you. It's the cry of a living being. I think that's pretty darn cool. It's the cry of a living being and can be heard by others. So now this is coming from around the throne of God. That means there are living beings crying around God. What would they be crying about? Maybe for me to get my life right with God? How about those he's chosen that didn't quite respond when he called them? How about those guys? Would there be any voices around that? 
You see what I'm saying? I just love what God's doing. Man, what an amazing God. Um, John sees seven torches of fire or light before the throne and knows they are the seven spirits of God. Now, how does he know that? I'm wondering. These are all things that must be seen in the spirit and by the spirit. It is no coincidence that there are seven churches Oops, represented by seven lampstands and in the present time, seven major denominational movements on earth. Seven is the number of sufficiency and fullness and completion. We all know that. If you don't, you just heard it. Are you okay with that? Um, since the time of the ascension of Jesus, there has been seven major denominational movements in the world, all of them believing in Jesus as Lord and many other similar aspects of the faith, starting with the universal church or Catholic. Uh, the very first uh, Christian church was called universal, in which the Greek word is Catholic. The Lutheran church, which didn't really get underway until 15, in the 1500s when Martin Luther posted his thesis. Protestant church was after that, protesting the Catholic church. Uh, the Baptist church, which was basically birthed out of the Protestant movement, meaning got to get baptized, don't think twice about it, don't do nothing but get baptized, make sure you get say get baptized and know the word of God until you can't think of anything but. Here you have it. Presbyterian, very important uh, to, the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Methodist Church and the Charismatic. Now, sometimes we call the Charismatic Church non-denominational uh, because it's not either Catholic, Lutheran, Protestant, Baptist, uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, or anything else. It is just what it would be classified as rebellion or rebellious into, by some people. I don't necessarily hold to that but there and there are thousands of branches of these movements um that are but they're based on these seven fundamental ones last count i think i read was forty-seven thousand denominations of christianity on the earth we can't seem to agree on anything except jesus is the christ that's a start that's a start anyway all right um I don't believe the Father's intent was for the movement to be threatened by the next movement, but to be enhancing the first, if you hear what I'm saying. I don't know if I'm making too much of that or not enough. Uh, we're supposed to be in unity. Um, if you know what I mean, that's John 17, 22. We're supposed to be in unity with each other, not in agreement. We don't agree. Uh, there's no reason to think we should. Or we'd all be wearing blue shirts and playing blue guitars if we were in agreement. I don't think that's necessary. I think there's something else that's got to happen with all of us. I think we have to come into a time of unity where I refuse to let go of a relationship I might have with you. And you with me. Or in any one of us. That's called unity. I'm going to not, you know, you, get, you come together, we come together. We're supposed to be together. They will know us by our love. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, how powerful would the Christian church be today if these moves of the Spirit were in close unity with each other? Unity, obviously, is different than agreement. All right. I'm, you know, part of my job is to insult people, so make sure if this is insulting you, then it's just my job. I'm just doing what I'm here for. You know what I'm saying. All right, verse 6 of chapter 4, Revelation. Keep yourself together here. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass. John is describing what he's looking at. Uh, as it were, I like the as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes, front and behind. Mmm, full of eyes. Sort of creepy. 
I think of things, gee, boy, I just like to be around somebody just eyes all over the place, you know, and stuff like that. I don't think it's what we would imagine it to be, if you can hear this. A sea of glass uh, is translated ice in some of the translations. In Revelation chapter 17, however, an angel of the Lord explains that water represents humanity and the glass and glass represents transparency. Hmm. So God is enthroned on a sea of transparent humanity. Hmm. So to get close to God, I have to be made transparent. Hmm. That doesn't sound exciting, does it? To be revealed or made transparent that you can see who you really are. Hmm. Ay, ay, ay. Later, the sea of glass is mingled with fire. That's in that's in uh, Revelation fifteen uh, two. Um, that's the first time the sea of glass is spoken about. It's mingled with fire. Of course, you know fire is a purifying fire. Humanity is coming to a place of transparency before God, though man usually fights every change that includes vulnerability. Uh, the refining fire, which is Malachi three two. Uh, of God is here now, though our distractions are limiting our vision to see it. Hmm. Many will only see it as an effect on the earth. Now, uh, we're living in a time where it looks like evil is ruling, doesn't it? It seems that way anyway. So I would ask you, do you think a refining fire from God is necessary? So when Malachi had mentions that he says, and he says it in Malachi 3, he said, you know, behold, I come quickly to my house, to my, to my temple. I come quickly, says the Lord. Um, and as a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap, the basic premise of that is so that the sacrifice of the Levites will be acceptable to me, says God. What he's trying to stop is a curse on the land. And that's when he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Spirit of Isaiah, or of Elijah on the earth. Now think about that just for a sec. Hmm. Behold, I come quickly like a refiner's fire so that Levites are the leaders, so to speak. Um, they taught the people. Uh, they sang in the, in the tabernacle. Uh, they, they prophesied. They taught the word of God. They taught people how to speak Hebrew. Uh, they taught. So the teachers have to make an acceptable sacrifice to God and a refining fire and a launderer's soap is what it requires for that to come to pass. Hmm. Now, that may be very upsetting to you. Um, especially if you really want to have the whole world think you're an amazing teacher, preacher, whatever that thing is, you know. I'd love to say, you know, I've been refined by God. Well, of course you've been refined, or you wouldn't speak a word. Uh, his word's been refined seven times. I'm guessing they'll be refining Don's words, don't you think? And how does he do that? Does he re define, refine the words or does he refine the speaker of the words? Hmm. Oops. Um, this scene is hard to imagine. With the limited thinking of human mind, John and, uh, and the times he lived in would be extremely difficult um, to to really describe this in comparative terms. There's nothing he can describe it that exists at that time. We wouldn't be able to describe it much better. Bible translators were faced with trying to further explain how this is likely to describe. The wisdom of God is, being, is bringing John uh, into this experience almost 2,000 years ago to perfect timing so the mysterious... The mysteries would remain alluring to a believer. Uh, you see what I'm saying? And they would be foolish fantasy to the, cynic, to the cynic or the skeptic. Hmm. 
Okay. Verse 7. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All kind of weird. What if one of the four living creatures just dropped right down here right now and just said, Hey, Don, let's talk. There'd be some strange stuff going on here now, wouldn't there? This, they're, just, they're just around the throne of God. But we would have a fit over one of them coming, probably casting out demons for years after the fact. So what's, what are we missing in our understanding between here and there? What connection, what better connections do we need to make if that kind of weirdo is right next to God and he ain't weird to God? God created them. They're very interesting looking. Okay. Um, some think that these are symbols of the four disciples who wrote the four Gospels that we know of. The lion being Mark, the ox uh, being Luke, and um, the man being Matthew, and the eagle being John. And it's possible. Um, that's very true. It's very possible. I have no idea. No matter what, was it, what has been seen uh, on earth in this form, that we, we still, God still created them, no matter what we think they are, no matter what that looks like to, to us. It doesn't matter what we think it means. Um, okay, now, John is relating what he sees. Using the word living each time means that these are alive and they are moving. Now, they have eyes, you know, they're full of eyes, front and back. Um, could mean that these are watchmen of sorts. Uh, the boldness of the lion, the brute strength of the ox, the cunning of the man, and the eyesight of the eagle are formidable weapons. And here's an idea. Be reminded that God will, push, will put scripture in front of you. And if you just read it and then just keep reading so you can get through the Bible and get to the other end, you'll get nothing out of the scriptures at all. But if you look at them and you stare at them long enough, what do you think will happen inside of you as you start to think about what that looks like? What if, this is a what if, this isn't a doctrine, what if the eyes are eyes of God? What if that gives all of these creatures the opportunity to see things and that God can see whatever they see? Because, you know, Our spirits are affected by what we look at. Our spirits are affected by what we look at. If you do not look at anything dark and nasty or whatever the words are, um, you probably won't have a dark and nasty spirit. You keep looking at dark and nasty stuff, it sort of comes out dark and nasty. Now, at the time that you'd like to not see those things, was probably in church, and that's the time when they start and they decide to re, uh, reproduce themselves, or then they come right back and they'll be right on your right on your schedule. Just as soon as you get in the church, you start thinking about those things you really probably shouldn't have been looking at. So okay, you shouldn't have looked at them. All right, big deal. So you get over it. Okay, ask forgiveness. Okay, I ask forgiveness. Is the thought gone? Is the vision gone? Hmm. No. How's that? Because this is a photographic, this is a photograph, this little clanker up in your head is a hard drive. It's, they don't erase easy. You can throw it in the trash, but it's not erased. I know, I know. Treading on a sacred cow there. But um, allowing him to see all things. What if these are eyes so God see all things? So wherever the four living creatures go, wherever they are, God can see everything they see with all those eyes. Are you hearing me? It's just a thought. Don't get crazy about it. All right. Is it possible that each of these creatures represent different nations on earth? The lion is the symbol of Scotland and England as well. The eagle is Germany's symbol, while the USA is represented by the bald eagle. Now just think about it. Uh, the ox once represented Egypt at ancient times. Now uh, China has the ox as representing different things like the gear of the ox. 
I'm not sure the nation with the face of a man. Who would that be? What nation would have the face of a man? Hmm. What if it's God's nation? A kingdom of priests. Just a thought. Just a thought. Don't get crazy. Verse 8. And the four living creatures, um, each of them with six wings, ooh, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is, and is to come. That's a good statement. Man, oh man. All right. Eyes all around and within can mean they are seers or watchmen of a kind, able to discern anything the king is revealing or able to see all things. Like the king's eyes. Eyes for the king. I think that's pretty incredible. Um, who was, who is, and who is to come means God is not hindered by time in any way. It also identifies that the, this prophetic book of Revelation has already happened, is happening, and has yet to come. We all know that, right? All right, verse 9. Do you know that, by the way? Do you know that what is, you know, Revelation, the whole book of Revelation has already happened. It, it is happening as we speak, and it is yet to come. Why would that be? Why well, I mean, you know, that's kind of mystic -y, you know, and that's kind of cryptic and weird and stuff. Yes, it is. But how can one thing be in the same place at the same time? How can Jesus be hung on the cross before the foundations of the earth? And yet have to come all the way this way, 2,000 years ago, to be hung on a cross... And yet he did that before the foundations of the earth. You understand we're a little on the short side when it comes uh, to understanding time. We can talk about it. We just can't understand it. I like, to, I like the whole time thingy, you know, whatever, go back in time or whatever the deal is. But stuff is just stuff. That's the way it is. We, we live linearly uh, for now. We won't forever. So... Verse 9, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him with or who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, you think God needs to hear that? I need to hear anything. Don, you're still there. You're still here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And you still have something for to do in God. Okay, great. Um, you might feel like you're not, you don't have anything to do, and you're just an old um, curmudgeon, and it's, at some point, you're out of here, and thank you very much. Our, my favorite is, aren't you done yet, man? Aren't you done trying to do something on the earth? Why don't you give it up? Why don't you just let it go? And, and all those are true. Those are all true. But until God says that's true, it ain't going to happen. See what I mean? It's not going to happen. There's nothing I can do about it changing all of that if I'm wanting to follow God. We're going to talk about some key things here now, and I'll, I'll make this quickie so I don't uh, bore you to death. All right. Um, glory, when he says you are worthy of glory, to receive glory, you are worthy to receive glory. Glory is the Greek word doxa. You probably know it, D-O-X-A, and it means favorable opinion. Isn't that interesting? This is the meaning of glory or doxa. Thus, the doxa of man is human opinion and is shifty. Ups. Uh, uncertain, often based on error. Uh-oh. And its pursuit for its own safety is unworthy. 
I'm trying to keep a favorable opinion of me. I'm trying to keep it safe. And my pursuit of keeping your favorable opinion of me safe, you see where this is going? Is a dangerous thing. That's what makes man's opinion shifty. Man's glory. Isn't that interesting? God's opinion marks the true value of things as they appear to the eternal mind. Whoa. And God's favorable opinion is true glory. So for God to be glorified, be glorified, O oh God. He has to glorify himself. Glorify thou me as I have glorified you. You see where that's going? When Jesus came to the earth, he had to glorify the Father. The Father glorified him. Why would that have to be? Because they're both God. I mean, they're both really a big deal. Why do they have to be? Why do they have to glorify? Because no opinion of man is adequate enough to give glory to God. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. When my heart gets tested enough, and enough of the fire of the Lord is in my life, then possibly my perspective of giving glory to God might merit a little bit. But unless the Lord himself, through his son Jesus, is passing glory back and forth between each other, they're not getting really glorified. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's clear that the glory of man is far from the deserved glory of God. Still man, men seek to be glorified instead of laying their crowns and accomplishments at the feet of an ever-living God. The only one worthy of a favorable opinion is God. So here's the elders, the 24 elders. We talked about that. They're, they're wearing crowns, nuptial joy, military valor. They're valuable to a community. And they take that with which they earned on earth and lay it at the feet of the Lord God. And that begins the process of every bit of accolade that I got for being a good guy. I lay at the feet of Jesus, lay at the feet of God. That begins to shape me in a way that the glory I want to offer to that God becomes actual glory. Does that make sense to you? Hmm. Why do I have to lay down? So we're not even—we're not talking about super high, wealthy, rich people here now, are we? We haven't even gotten to that because there isn't easier for a rich man, uh, for a camel to crawl through the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he's so filled up with glory, his own self-glory. You get what I'm going? His or hers doesn't make any difference. I'm just saying you shouldn't ever be successful. We're saying, oh, you're saying. I'm not saying nothing like that. I'm saying for me or you to offer a glory to God, I've got to come off of needing glory for me. Way off. I got to come off of that. I got to take that thing off and lay it at the feet of the Lord. I have learned to play the guitar. Yes, I have. Why? Because God prospered me to learn to play. Prosper doesn't mean I'm rich. It means I have the ability to do something if I apply myself because God gave me the prosperity to be a musician. I didn't have to take it, but I did. And so what do I have? I have something I can lay at his feet and do it very regularly. And that brings him glory. Why? Because I could do an awful lot with this, and I have done a lot with it. And all that did is prove that I could do a lot with it so that I laid it at his feet because he's the only one worthy of all that it took to get all that accolade from men at whatever point that was in my life. And now that accolade is, a, is laid at his feet because he gave it to begin with. See, see the exchange? He gives glory to your life. You give glory to him by laying that life at his feet. Mm. 
Interesting, isn't it? That mess with you? Mess with me. Uh, another thing God gets is honor. And the Greek word is time. T-I-M-E. Time. <laughs> it's got little squiggles all around it, so it's not quite probably pronounced correctly. So don't hate me. Um, this means respect, reverence of a state or a condition of honor, rank, a dignitary joined with doxa, an officer of honor, an office of honor. Metaphorically, it means compensation, remuneration. Isn't that interesting? Uh, that which is paid in honor uh, for another's work. That's in First Timothy. Double honor mentioned in First Timothy five seven uh, probably refers to an honorarium or a wage. <laughs> so honor is there. So give honor. To give honor, respect and reverence for a rank or the dignitary, or the dignity rather, for the office of honor is a challenge for those who seek the glory and honor for themselves. Hmm. 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 When we look at the meaning of this word metaphorically, we see where the word honorarium, of course, came from. Uh, sometimes the church-going believer is taught that giving is honoring God. Hmm. Metaphorically, that is true, but that is not what the elders around the throne are doing. Do you see what I'm saying? They are showing their respect for God's rank who he is. They're showing for his dignity and for the office of honor. Wow. Giving is not honoring the glory of God. It is keeping the church alive. That's not a sin. That's not terrible. But don't think you're honoring God. Not like that. It's your life that honors him. Though it is very important to give, especially where there is respect uh, and for those who deserve it and who have sacrificed and so on and so forth, there's a lot there. Power, that's another word. You are worthy of the power and the glory and so on and so forth. This is not what you think it's going to mean. It's worthy, and the Greek word is dunamis. That's the word they use. You know, we've all heard the word, you know, I got miracle power. Guess what dunamis actually means? In the Complete Word Study Bible, the Greek word is defined as to be able to, especially achieving power of miraculous power to heal the sick. That's the one we like. I like that one. Thayer's uh, is another uh, exhaustive concordance, and it states moral power and excellence of soul, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Sin exercises its power upon the soul through the law, through the abuse of the law, the power which the resurrection of Jesus has, whoops, now we're talking about we're serious here, for instructing, reforming, uh, elevating, and tranquilizing, whoops, the soul of the power of the devil and the evil spirits used of the divine power considered as acting upon the minds of man. It is ascribed to Christ as a power to heal disease that proceeds from him, the power of Christ, invisibly present and operating, operative in the Christian church. Now, so Jesus didn't actually heal the sick based on how strong he was, but by his moral character. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. By virtue of his nature. Wow. Do you think that's a little bit on the high side there? Moral power, excellence of soul, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. <laughs> I know when I first got saved, I wanted power to heal people. I wanted to heal people. Why? So I could get a lot of glory for that, the very glory that's supposed to be belonging to God. But 
I would be very humble about getting all that glory. I wouldn't let anybody think I wanted that glory. I just wanted to see people healed. You know, I have a lot of compassion for people, even though I know they would be shouting my name and a bus would probably have Don Heals written on the side. Right? Isn't that what we want power for? Do you see where this is going? That's not power, my friends. Power is character. Power is letting God put you on the sea of glass. Letting God put you in a place of transparency so that you can be near Him. And when you get done being afraid of the, seven, of the four living creatures and the 24 elders that are all around God and these shouts of glory that keep going up in heaven and all this stuff that keeps happening, when you get over that, then you might be able to move in the power of healing people without trying to get glory for yourself. Jesus heals the eyes of someone who's blind and they walk away giving glory to God. How did he do that? How did he do that? If we can learn that, we'd have something happen for us. All right. There's a desire for power, and we've been pretty bad about it for a long, long time. We're not very good about this, and I'll let you go. Still, the desire for power remains, but it is clear that no such power will be granted to believers without a real change in moral character and an excellence of soul being present. Mm. Much could be said about this word and still leave an unsolved mystery as to what and why this escapes the everyday believer. This is because the power to heal, save, or to move mountains is a byproduct of virtue by nature, moral power, and excellence of soul. Uh, none of that can be gained by the desire for it, but from longing for a relationship with the Lord. Well, I'm hoping I've said some insulting things or wounded you in some way or another, but it's hard to tell sometimes. Um, but what I would say is in the name of the Lord Jesus, of which we dare not live without nor die without, that we need more. We believers need more of what's going on here. This is surrounding the throne of God. This is happening naturally. I want my glory to be given to him, not to me. And I want to find and get, lay down everything that belongs to me, to him, because it actually came from him. So you need it, I need it. Let's get there. Let's not mess around with this any longer. We need our unity. We need to change. We need God. We need Jesus Christ on the throne of my life. Simple. Can you give me any reason you cannot make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and no other? Amen. <laughs>